started here. We'll begin with Jude. There were a couple things that we had left uh, there at the end of March that I had promised we would be able to kind of pick up again um, today, uh, today. So that's what I'd like to do. Go to Jude. And that's this uh, white sheet here, the content there on the front. So this letter is again written by uh, the half-brother of our Lord. And after some introductory material, in verse 3, he addresses his hearers and readers as beloved, agape toy, those who are loved by God. Um, kind of laying out the, the rationale for why he's writing. But then in verse 4, he dives right in to the heart of the book uh, as he starts to go after false teachers. And in, there's a little bit of a difference that can be detected between Jude and 2 Peter. In Jude, the false teachers, uh, if this is the congregation, they, they have come in from outside. Whereas in 2 Peter, couple different uh, verbs that occur uh, lead one to uh, realize that the false teachers were actually once simply part of the congregation and, and still are in a sense, but they've wandered from the truth and they're leading others away from it as well. So they're, they're right inside, whereas Jude, they came in from outside. So verse 4 through 19 um, is really something that then Peter, in his second letter, 2 Peter, will uh, take up and incorporate within the body of his own writing. So Jude, that's this other sheet with the uh, comparison of some similarities and uh, verses where they're dealing with the same topic, even using the same vocabulary. Peter does do some editing in this process. Uh, we might uh, notice a couple of those things. But to Jude, if you go to the last um, four verses or so, for, so verse uh, 20, 21, 22, 23. 20 and 21 deal with faith. 22 and 23 deal with love. You heard that in the post-communion collect that was actually authored by Dr. Luther. Uh, we thank you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Uh, and so the Holy Sacrament has that benefit one of, as one of its uh, gifts to us. So 20 and 21, let's see uh, faith here. So Jude addresses his readers and hearers, you beloved, there it is again, agape toy, loved by God. Uh, you uh, who are loved by God, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So there again is uh, that hope, that theme of hope, to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And then 22 and 23 are, on the other hand, love. So what does now faith flow forth? into and show itself as have mercy so yourselves you're waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ but as you wait with total hope you are uh, loving those around you especially in the same congregation so again I think I, I mentioned this it's not first of all family it's not first of all um, strangers that we love although we are in our vocations and uh, from God's own word, we are to love here. But the key is, I can't write it all on there, but congregation. So that's what Luther's praying about in the post-communion collect, that we would grow in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, the same ones that have received the same gift from the same Lord, namely his own body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, these are the ones that that prayer is referring to. So this, yes, also that and that, but the focus 
of when the New Testament talks about love one another, when Jesus says love one another, it is your fellow Christians beginning with congregation. So what does this love look like now that flows out of faith? Verse 22. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. So that's very vivid, isn't it? The fire of judgment and of hell. Uh, that's what's coming uh, to those who don't believe. And so Peter is saying, or Jude is saying here, snatch them out of that by means of your faithful witness, confession of the truth, holding on to the promises of God found in his word, and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. We talked about that a little bit last week, that um, rebuking the sin in others requires great wisdom and care, whereas when it comes to ourselves and our own life, uh, show no mercy. They crucify the flesh, Paul says. That's the baptismal life. But when it comes to others, uh, you need to be a little careful so that you're not dragged in and dragged down by their sin, that it begins to entice you as well. Okay. Um, and as you deal with it, again, that care uh, and um, wisdom is, is important and courage. Uh, 24 and 25, I just wanted to point this out. This is the conclusion. It's a doxology. Um, and in your sheet here it says doxological, eschatological, big words, uh, confession of faith. So eschatological refers to the end. And so again, we always have that um, as Christians. We always are looking ahead. Uh, that hope, that little while, mikron, Pastor Moss mentioned in the sermon today. That little while in which we must endure suffering and sorrow, but that lasts just for a little while. The joy lasts forever that Christ is bringing. Okay. And so here's this uh, wonderful conclusion. In fact, uh, President Barry, who was president of Missouri Synod in the 1990s, he would conclude every uh, letter or Lutheran Witness uh, article uh, with these words as his uh, conclusion. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So I just wanted to make a quick little note here on this doxology. Uh, there you see the fourth bullet point. Uh, this doxological formula, uh, and it's, you see it in all the epistles in the New Testament here, uh, concludes the same kind of way. It has four parts, the recipient of praise, in this case, verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so he's the recipient of praise, the elements of praise, glory, majesty, dominion, authority, uh, let us see the indication of time, before all time, and now, and forever, and then the confirmatory response, Amen. And by the way, that makes us uh, kind of perk up a little bit here. That's a very important indicator that uh, this writing was read in the assembly. Okay? So it wasn't just like Jude uh, wrote the words, sent the letter, and he was thinking in his mind, there's going to be a Christian, a recipient, sitting in their living room, reading these words silently to themselves. No, from the very get-go, his intention in writing was precisely this, that the letter is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is sent to the recipients, and again, in the congregation, this letter would be read out loud. Okay? It has these worship elements in it. Okay? This doxology at the conclusion and the word amen, which is the word of the congregation. Uh, and so it's vital that when we're gathered together, we're praying. You have one who is leading the prayer, but everyone is praying. And the congregation uh, adds its amen at the end, loud and clear. Uh, that word is the congregation's word. Uh, and in uh, various other points in the service. So uh, point number two, 
shows, uh, you can take a look at that later on your own if you choose, um, how scriptures were read in the Christian assemblies. Certainly the Old Testament was read in the synagogues around the Mediterranean. Um, but now the apostolic writings, the letters, the gospel writings, uh, they too are being read. And there's little indicators, even in the text itself, that that's the intention here. These are to be read aloud publicly in the gathered assembly, and it's a liturgical gathering, a liturgical assembly, where there's doxology, there's the amen. Um, I wrote up here, uh, these are the Psalms. The book of Psalms has 150 Psalms divided. The book itself is divided into five books. And if you read Psalm 41, at the end of that Psalm, there's attached a doxology. It, which has a lot of the same features that Jude concludes his letter with. If you read Psalm 72, at the end of that psalm, there's a doxology. It doesn't really, in a sense, flow right from the psalm, but it was added there as a marker that this is the conclusion of this book, this book, this book, this book, and then 150 concludes book 5 and the entire Psalter. So this kind of appending of a doxology uh, that looks a lot like what Jude has here. It's found in these places within the Psalms. Okay. So these scriptural writings are also liturgical documents okay, for the gathered congregation and assembly. And that's really their, their true home. So it's not me sitting, in my sofa, sitting on my sofa, kind of reading my Bible all by myself, kind of quiet. Can that be done? Yes. Should that be done? Definitely. Okay. But the intention, uh, as evident in the documents themselves, is the assembly and that verbal, public uh, reading and preaching of the word. All right. Um, and by the way, a little word on that, maybe just a quick uh, talk on that. It's a Hebrew word like alleluia is, or hallelujah. And amen means, uh, it's related to the Hebrew noun, for truth, MF. MF means truth, and Amen is, that's uh, being highlighted there. So a prayer is offered to the triune God, and the congregation gathered together uh, thunders Amen, and they're saying, This is true. Remember how Luther concludes uh, in the Catechism regularly, this is most certainly true. So this is a, a liturgical word um, related to the word for truth. <coughs> All right. Uh, this sheet here, I have a time written up on the board, 10.05. I'd like to um, move at that point uh, to kind of get a running start for next week because next week I'd like to... Um, it, we're going to have a special class. It wasn't originally on the schedule, but uh, May 2nd, we're going to look at uh, Scripture. What is it? Um, so it's a little bit uh, more broad, but uh, Peter in his writings uh, touches on this a couple different times, and so it's an uh, important topic. Um, and so I'd like to get a little bit of a running start uh, in looking at that. So the sheet here... What we did is you might want to have 2 Peter 2 open, and then you've got this sheet to see kind of both of them there in action. You could go the other way, too, if you want Jude open. Um, it's up, entirely up to you. Like I said, so Jude writes first, although there's argument about that, but... Um, and then Peter, when he's writing his second letter, sees this document from Jude and incorporates it, alters it a little bit. Uh, so, for example, one of the main things that's interesting is that Jude, in his letter, has a lot of references that he brings forward from um, non-biblical writings. So the, uh, most of these were write, uh, written between the Testaments. So Malachi, last uh, writing prophet, and then uh, Christ appearing at the Jordan. In that whole span of uh, a couple hundred years, hundreds of years, 
there was no prophecy in Israel. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of activity going on. There was a lot of writing, uh, and um, the Jews had spread around the Mediterranean. So this is uh, in the era of um, Alexander the Great. He died in 323. Uh, remember, they, the Jews themselves had come back from exile, uh, which is, historically speaking, uh, impossible, but it happened. It's amazing. Um, that a, a nation that was off into exile actually returns. That doesn't happen under normal circumstances. And they rebuilt the temple, so you're talking 513 BC, so some dates. Alexander the Great conquers the known world and, and dies in 323. Uh, Julius Caesar lives, we'll say, 50s BC. Okay, and he takes over as um, basically dictator. Um, and um, then his uh, son is um, Augustus Caesar. And so he's around the turn of the, the times from BC to AD. So for these hundreds of years, there's not much going on among the prophets in Israel. But there is a lot of writing going on, and a lot of it is kind of strange. So it's... Um, uh, during this time, uh, if you ever heard of the Maccabees, all right, uh, they threw off the yoke of um, the empire that arose after Alexander died. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had um, set up an altar in the temple courts and sacrificed a pig on it, and so desecrated the whole place. And uh, that was the last straw. So Judas uh, Maccabeus, uh, there's a bunch of uh, you know, first Maccabees, second Maccabees. These are books, that, Jewish books. And uh, he and his brothers rise up. And uh, Macca, uh, Judas Maccabeus, uh, the name means the hammer. And so he throws off the Syrians that were in the north under Alexander's empire here. And he get rid of the pagans and their influence. And so, you know, we want to be pure. We want to be uh, good Jews, uh, you know, living according to the, the prophets and the law. Um, and then the Pharisees kind of come out of that later on. Um, but during this time, there's a lot of these uh, writings going on. The Jews are spreading around the Mediterranean, so there's a big, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people living in Alexandria and Egypt, hundreds of thousands living in Rome, um, in Ephesus, different places around the Mediterranean, in Greece, in Italy. Um, and while that's happening, uh, there's a lot of these other writings. So I mentioned the books of the Maccabees. Uh, there's First Enoch, which Jude quotes in his letter. There's a, a writing called The Assumption of Moses, which Jude quotes in his letter. The interesting thing is that Jude quotes these, and when Peter is taking him up and using him in his own letter, what he does is he drops those. He doesn't include those in his writing. So he follows Jude, and a lot of the examples Jude used, but it, the, the ones he chooses to omit are precisely the non-biblical things that um, Jude had brought forward. Um, one thing to just kind of bear in mind, some of my Bible classes know this, um, in the early church they had these books that were called testimonies. And they'd be divided into categories uh, and they were to be used in dialoguing with Jews. Okay, so what's the Christian understanding of the scriptures? So it's Old Testament, uh, and they, what these writings did is they gathered together certain verses that uh, applied to a certain issue. So uh, Christ as the sacrifice, they'd gather like four or five verses from the Old Testament, make a couple comments, and that would help the believer then as they're witnessing, we would call it today, as they're talking with uh, Jews among whom they live, they would know, well, you know, Isaiah, uh, um, Genesis uh, 22, these verses here, these are what you want to use if you're going to talk about Christ as sacrifice. Talk about the temple. Well, then I'll list a couple verses. Um, what I would compare this to is Jude has assembled together a bunch of Old Testament and intertestamental, between Old and New Testament, uh, examples of how you attack false teachers. 
And Peter says, hey, that's a good list. I like that. And he incorporates it. He actually adds a couple things of his own. But he also drops a lot of the ones that Jude had put forward. So that's a little bit of what's going on. Jude, the whole book. Peter's second chapter in his second letter. Uh, maybe just take up this little sheet here. Um, and if you have 2 Peter open, so Jude is in that left column there, and it's basically going verse by verse, and then the corresponding uh, reality there in 2 Peter is to the right. And if you look, there's a little bit of a gap between Jude 7 and 8, and then 2 Peter 6, or 2 verse 6, and 2 Peter 2 verse 10. So let's take a look at the gap there. Uh, 7, 8, and 9, and 2 Peter 2. So Peter includes this reference, uh, he unpacks even further. Um, Jude just focuses on the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter does that, but then also, because this is what he's doing, not just judgment, like Jude had done, Sodom and Gomorrah, but also the salvation that was granted to righteous Lot. So Peter brings in, Jude just focuses here, Peter says yes to that, but then also adds this because that's what he's, his goal is. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, here's another one. Uh, Judah 11. Compare, uh, so on the back side of that sheet, at the top there's Jude verse 11. Compare that to 2 Peter 2 verse 15. And what do you notice? brings three examples for it. Remember, he likes those um, threefold uh, rep, uh, repetition here. So he brings Cain, Balaam, and Korah, and Peter has only Balaam. And so he doesn't talk about Cain or about Korah. And I guess maybe one of the things there is that Balaam was an outsider who was asked to curse Israel, the Midianites paid him to do it. God intervened, wouldn't let him speak that way about uh, God's people. And uh, then there's the story with the donkey, uh, and then later uh, God commands Israel to exterminate the Midianites, and Balaam also gets executed in the process. Uh, but uh, we kind of laid that out last week. So Balaam is a, an example of an outsider who uh, opposes God's people, Israel. Um, let's go to, well, if you look at uh, verse, let's see. Yeah, go to Jude 17 and 18 on that chart, and then it uh, corresponds 2 Peter 3, verses 2 through 3. What kind of difference do you notice there? In Jude, what does he do? He actually quotes them. In the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. That was the uh, uh, apostle's warning. By the way, Jude is not himself an apostle. His authority comes via um, his uh, connection to James, who is called an apostle. So they're both brothers, and James and Jude both are half-brothers of Jesus. Uh, so Jude actually gives the quote from the apostles, whereas Peter just you know, gives the content of it. 
I like how he wor words it there. Remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior uh, through your apostles. Peter is always, in both 1 Peter and 2 Peter, he's always very inclusive. Um, wanting to highlight that, um, that the apostles don't stand above other Christians or other ministers, but rather are stand in the middle, okay, with. Um, so maybe just one last thing with this sheet. If you go back to the first page, Jude 4 and 2 Peter 2, this, I think, is just kind of an interesting literary type thing, not really a theological or doctrinal. But if you notice how Jude puts his material forward, and then look at what Peter does with it. So he expands it, and the blue, long ago, is first in Jude. Where is it found in 2 Peter 2? It, it's last. So for Jude, it goes like this. One, two, three, four. So blue, green, gray, purple. For Peter, it goes purple, gray, green, blue. So he's just he's taking everything Jude had put forward and himself now as author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving the same thing, but Reordering it. Do you guys remember, uh, you know, when you had to write papers, and you know you can't plagiarize, so you need to take what you've read and put it in your own words. Okay, so sometimes that just involves kind of reordering things a little bit. Okay, uh, in a sense, you could say maybe that's what uh, Peter has done here. Uh, so just want to kind of point that out. Uh, one thing before going uh, forward here. Um, that quote from First Enoch, maybe let's go to Jude. If you'd uh, turn to Jude. So Jude is quoting from a book called First Enoch. This is one of those intertestamental between Old Testament and New Testament writings, although it's actually a lot... Um, more complex than that. It's, this document has about six different parts to it, and they span from about 300 BC uh, to maybe about 100 AD, the different parts. Um, and the quote that Jude has is from 1 Enoch 1, verse 9, and if you go... Uh, so, verse 14 of Jude. It was also about these, uh, so just simply these. Whenever you see that in Jude, it means the false teachers. He doesn't even want to name them. He just calls them those guys or these men. Okay? So he doesn't even kind of give them a name. Well, wouldn't that be all based on... There were so many more false teachings today. Think creationism, they didn't have to deal with that back then. Abortion, they didn't have to deal with those false teachings. And well, this is so much longer, I would think, today. You know, talking, listening to my younger kid, my own kids, and the ones falling away from church, we have so many more things pulling our kids away from church, you know, <coughs> denying the church completely. Right, you know, creationism it's. Creationism and all that, and this is just. Again, Scripture's doing a great job laying out you got to be wary of false teaching. Because right. if you let one thing go, you're letting the whole Bible go. If you let creation go, you let everything go. And you actually, let sanctity of life go, you let the whole Bible go. And Peter does um, bring on creation. So where Jude didn't kind of focus on that, Peter will spend a verse or two on that. So they were fighting that battle already then. And definitely abortion, by the way. Um, Christianity changed uh, the pagan world. Uh, for the pagans, it was no problem to abort. Uh, but Christ Christianity, with its confession of uh, the creed, trying God and create, uh, as creator, and uh, that the Son of God became a human being in the womb of the Virgin Mary, you know, all these things 
uh, are doctrinal statements, but they also impinge on moral issues. Okay? And so Christianity really kind of revolutionized uh, standard views on life, and uh, including abortion. Yeah, so all the, really, Dana, I, I would really argue that a lot of things we're dealing with today are definitely in the New Testament. I mean, they're fighting the, the, exactly the same battle. What we're seeing is that the world that had been pagan, that was Christianized over hundreds and even thousands of years, is now re-paganized. It's going to a repaganization, okay, um, where that's kind of gaining the upper hand. So secularism and denial of uh, basic uh, doctrinal biblical teachings—that's um, where we're at. So the the books that were used to go from here to here, we can use now. Uh, so both these the scriptures and the early church and their uh, arguments. Uh, we need to be able to use those uh, now as well. So Enoch, um, verse 14 of Judah, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay. So he calls him a prophet. He lived, you know, a couple hundred years after the creation of the world, so seventh from Adam. He's prophesying. It's incorporated in this writing, and Jude regards it as prophecy. The interesting thing is that this first chapter of 1 Enoch is excellent, but there's some other parts of the writing later on that have some weird things in them and that the church could not accept. So this is good, but some later things are not accepted. Uh, this is not only accepted, uh, it's actually quoted under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, did you know that Paul, the apostle, he quotes Greek poets, so not even uh, biblical figures, but Greek poets, uh, three different times in his writings and in his speaking. Um, so what is that saying? They're, you know, these Greek poets were not inspired by the triune God, but what they wrote in that particular instance that Paul is willing to make use of um, is in line with uh, God's own teaching and, and will. Uh, and so Paul tries to take the pagan's own way of arguing about a certain topic and incorporating it um, to teach them a little more deeply. Um, all right, let's uh, go back to 2 Peter. Uh, chapter 1, verse 16. What we see Peter doing here, we've seen him do before. So in Acts chapter 2, here it's uh, 2 Peter 1. It begins there at verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what this is helping us do is it, um, it, it's like it's called a mirrored reading, where based on this writing here, you can kind of piece together what the opponents were teaching, what the false teachers were saying. Uh, and so they were charging the congregations, the believers, of giving heed to the apostles and they were trying to undermine their authority by saying those apostles that you're listening to, they follow these myths. They've made up myths about this Jesus Christ 
who lived a perfect life under God's law. Okay, because that goes against what they're teaching. And so Peter has to confront that. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. In Acts chapter 2, what he does is, remember, the crowd gathers, they heard this sound, uh, this wind, and so they've gathered all together, and the apostles are there, and they start proclaiming, and the people are amazed that they can hear this in their own language, but some of the crowd were saying, these men are drunk. So before Peter launches into the sermon he wants to preach, he's got to deal with that objection. And so he says, these men are not drunk. Okay? And then he takes it the next step. He goes back. This is what the prophet Joel wrote about. Joel chapter 2. In the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Uh, and on my servants, both male and female, uh, they will prophesy. Okay. So he goes back to Joel 2. Here, in 2 Peter 1, where does Peter go back? So the apostles, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Where does he go? Not the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, in this case. Look at the end of verse 16, and then verse 17, 18. Yep, what event? What was it? Nope. Very close to the... Yeah, exactly. Very good. The transfiguration. So the first letter of Peter is built on baptism. The second letter of Peter is really built... Everything is built off of this. Transfiguration of Christ. Okay. Um, and we're going to next week want to pay attention to uh, how this event is important in terms of uh, scripture, okay? which is kind of partly what Peter does then also here. So look at verse 19. So he denies this he, and goes back to base that denial on this reality. And then he makes a, so in Acts chapter 2, these men are not drunk. He goes back to Joel and then he launches into his sermon, which by the way is law and gospel. And it quotes scripture. It's, some, it's like a Lutheran sermon today. All right, law, gospel, uh, refers to the means of grace at the end. Uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Okay, uh, and old quotes the scriptures. Here, Peter denies and gives the basis for the denial and then launches uh, into a positive statement about scripture, verse 19. So not cleverly devised myths, far from that. We have something very sure, the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So the word and its ongoing use uh, is from God, not from man. And then... Then he circles back, and basically chapter 2, using Jude, the whole book of Jude, he circles back, and he, he says, let's just reverse the charge. There's, what they teach is something fabricated, is what he calls it in 2 Peter 2. They're the ones that are inventing things. Okay? That, and none of them saw this, Peter says. I did. Okay? And I'm going to use my, the full weight of my authority and the reality of this to serve the congregation, the church, in my own day. And look at us today. We're reading the same book. Okay? And we're being built on the same kind of argument here. We can have confidence, too, that the, one, one of the witnesses who saw this um, gives it forward. So let's just maybe conclude with that. Tell me, give me some examples of uh, holy writings uh, that are out there.
like in Islam, what would it be called? Quran? How about that wonderful American religion, uh, Utah? Book of Mormon. It's a great American, it's a prototypical American religion. None of these, or the Hindu scriptures, none of these have this. Okay. Where God, or basically we can put it this way, heaven and earth meet. Heaven is found on earth. Um, God is among men. Um, both the Father with His voice and the Son in the flesh. Um, and Peter, it's interesting to con contrast the writers of these books versus Peter. He is first, before he writes, he must be a witness. Okay. Before he speaks, he's got to listen. Okay. Three years of training. Before he preaches Pentecost, he has to see the risen Lord and wait and receive the Spirit that he promised, and now all that happens. So there's a very clear apprenticeship, first to Jesus and the Father's voice, but then also to all the scriptures that come before. It is the care and concern of every biblical writer to um, basically, it starts with Moses, and everybody looks to him. Okay? So all the prophets look to Moses. And then the New Testament writers, they look to the prophets and to Moses as well in their own writings. Just like Peter did on Pentecost. He quotes from the Psalms and some other places in his sermon and in his writing, in his two letters we've seen him actually quote from the writings that come before and that's a, a vital part of genuine uh, scripture is that it has to um, agree with what has been given prior uh, the interesting thing is that Muslims and Mormons actually both will claim that Christians have, um, let's not get into that. We'll get into that more, uh, we'll get into that more potentially next week. But next week I want to look at um, the reality of Scripture. Uh, Peter talked about it there in uh, 2 Peter 1 at the end of the chapter, flowing on transfiguration. Uh, he'll talk about it again in chapter 3. He's quoted it and drawn examples from the Old Testament in chapter 2. And so we want to take a look at all these facets of uh, Scripture and the connection between Old Testament writings and New Testament writings. And uh, the newsletter article for May also uh, begins to touch on that, and we'll be taking part of that up uh, next week. Any questions uh, on Jude and Second Peter, those two, how they connect so well? All right, let's close then with the collect for the day. Almighty God, you show those in error the light of your truth, so that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant faithfulness to all who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's church, that they may avoid whatever is contrary to their confession and follow all such things as are pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. That prayer definitely fits Jude and Second Peter to a T.